On the campaign trail in 2020, Joe Biden was clear. Diplomacy was the way to curb Iran's nuclear ambitions and undo the damage that Donald Trump had done by exiting the 2015 Iran nuclear deal. As president, I'd renew our commitment to arms control for a new era. The historic Iran nuclear deal we negotiated blocked Iran from gaining nuclear weapons. Yet Trump cast it aside, prompting Iran to restart its nuclear program, become more provocative, and raising the risk of another disastrous war in the region. If Tehran returns to compliance with the deal, I would rejoin the agreement. But 16 months into his presidency and four years since his predecessor scuttled the historic nuclear deal with Iran, Biden seems no closer to renewing that deal. Not only did talks break down last month, but Israel just launched the largest military drill in the history of its military, a four-week exercise simulating a large-scale conflict. And in the exercise's final week, according to Axios, Israel will train for a possible aerial attack on nuclear facilities inside of Iran. The new general in charge of U.S. Central Command just happened to arrive in Israel Tuesday. The Pentagon says a small number of U.S. personnel are observing the exercises, but it denied earlier reports that U.S. jets were participating in the Iran drill. And sometimes a drill is just a drill. Nevertheless, the exercises come as Iran vowed revenge for the assassination in Tehran on Sunday of a colonel from its Revolutionary Guard. No one claimed responsibility for that killing. Just last week, Israeli Defense Minister Benny Gantz traveled to Washington for meetings on Iran with Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. And just before his U.S. trip, Gantz made some bold statements about Iran's nuclear posture. Iran continued to enrich uh, uranium, as we all know, and uh, they are very uh, close uh, to the 90% capabilities. Uh, I would say, a few weeks uh, uh, away from it. Of course, that does not mean they're a few weeks away from having actual nuclear weapons. Even the Israelis said back in February that it would take another few years for that to be possible. But remember, the fact that we're talking about Iran's nuclear progress in 2022 is because Donald Trump, with Israeli government encouragement, scuttled a deal that was working back in 2018. And while renewed talks have broken down, Israel is making preparations for war and even making overtures to other enemies of Iran in the region. Axios now reports that President Biden is trying to mediate a long-standing territorial dispute in the Red Sea between Israel and Saudi Arabia. And if it works out, it could be a first step in normalizing relations between those two nations, both of whom see Iran as the top threat in the region. So much for Joe Biden calling Saudi Arabia a pariah, also on the campaign trail. Could this all be part of a U.S. diplomatic strategy to further isolate Iran in the region and thereby convince them to return to the negotiating table? Or could it be a prelude to an escalation that leads to a new war in the Middle East? Trida Parsi joins me now. He's written extensively on U.S.-Iran relations, including the 2017 book Losing an Enemy, Obama, Iran and the Triumph of Diplomacy. He's also executive vice president at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. Uh, thank you for coming back on the show. Trida, on Sunday, a senior okay. colonel in Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps was killed by gunmen outside his home. His burial was held uh, Tuesday in Tehran. Israel has not taken responsibility. They never openly do. In the past, U.S. officials have kind of suggested that Israel has been behind a campaign of assassinations of Iranian nuclear scientists. What do you make of what just happened? And is this the beginning of an escalation that leads to war? Well, it certainly seems to be an escalation. Now, you're quite correct. The Israelis have not taken credit for this, although in the Israeli press they do talk about it as if it is a step that Israel took. I think when we take a look at who has the capacity, who has the motivation, and who is willing to accept the risk of conducting such an assassination in Iran, the list comes down to only two countries, the United States and Israel. And in fact, when you really take a look at the risk factor, I think that actually excludes the U.S., and then you only have Israel. So I don't think it's surprising, particularly mindful of the past assassinations, which the Israelis did conduct, and some of them they did take uh, uh, credit for. <clears throat> it's not surprising that most of the speculation is uh, looking towards Israel. The question is, why are they doing it and why are they doing it now? And the pattern of the past is that the Israelis didn't assassinate an Iranian nuclear scientist when the Iranians were on the cusp of a nuclear breakthrough. They assassinated these uh, scientists 
when the U.S. and Iran were on the cusp of a diplomatic breakthrough and they were seeking to, to undermine the diplomatic uh, uh, prospect. And it may very well so, be that that is the case here as well, particularly mindful of the fact that it's not a scientist that they, they killed this time around if it was them, but rather an IRGC so, official. And the status of the IRGC is a key sticking point right now. So the timing of this recent uh, assassination is very interesting. Joe Biden has an upcoming trip to the Middle East at the end of next month. And according to multiple sources who spoke to CNN, it may include a stop in Saudi Arabia to meet with the crown prince. I know you're plugged into a lot of folks in the Biden administration, especially those working on trying to restore or renegotiate an Iran deal. What is their calculation with this Middle East visit? Is it to isolate Iran further in order to secure a better deal? Or is it just the U.S. moving on from that deal and doubling down on its alliances with Saudi Arabia and Israel? More than anything, it is the fact that despite the rhetoric from the president earlier on, the, the, the JCPOA simply doesn't seem to be the priority that he promised that it would be and, and in the views of many should be. I think what you're seeing happening in the region is that the, Trump, uh, the Biden administration seems tempted to see if they can outdo Trump when it comes to the Abrams Accord and expand on that. And, and the real prize is, would be to get the Saudis to uh, normalize with Israel. The cost of that, of course, is the normalization of Saudi Arabia itself and its uh, leader, MBS, which thus far Biden has refused to meet with. But everything Biden has said <clears throat> on Saudi Arabia, he's essentially walked back now because he promised to make them a pariah. He promised to not sell them more weapons. He promised all of these different things one by one. He's walked them back. If they go forward so, with a normalization deal with Israel, then he's walked that last thing of Saudi Arabia back as well. Trina, a deal was supposed to have happened by now. A lot of people thought it would have happened by now. We always hear there's a, if there's a will, there's a way. Does Joe Biden just lack the political will? Do Democrats lack the will? You have people like, it's easy to talk about anti-Iran right-wing Republican hardliners, but you also have people like Senator Bob Menendez, uh, the hawkish chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, who's no fan of the Iran nuclear deal. What is blocking the Democrats from doing this now, especially ahead of midterms, where they're likely to lose control of Congress? I think it comes down to two issues. First of all, uh, a significant mistake that was committed by the Biden administration early on. They could have, at most, just simply walked back into the deal through an executive order, or at a minimum, if they were going to pursue a diplomatic strategy, would have truly pursued a diplomatic strategy with positive measures and uh, an effort to actually improve the atmosphere. They didn't do any of that. Instead, they talked about a longer and stronger deal. And as a result, 14, 18 months later now, we're still in a negotiation that so far has been inconclusive. The other mistake is, frankly, that you're quite right. The political will is not there. It's not that they don't want the deal. It's just that they don't want it bad enough, so they're willing to pay the political price in Washington because of all of these lawmakers that are opposed to the deal on the Republican side or lawmakers on the uh, Democratic side that are taking the side of the Israeli prime minister or the previous Israeli prime minister on this issue. Uh, they just don't want to deal with that mess, essentially. And as so, a result, here, here's where we are. But the question that comes, though, is this. The Biden administration has been right in pointing out that this is Trump's fault and that Trump's maximum pressure strategy was a massive failure. But a year and a half into his administration, Biden is essentially continuing that strategy. For how long yes. can he continue Trump's and failed maximum pressure strategy without being responsible for its continued failure? So on that, we're out of time. One last quick question. Obviously, Biden it does seem to be pushing a lot of that agenda, as you point out. But you have EU leaders who never wanted to end the deal. Even they have criticized Iran for continuing to expand its enriched uranium stockpile in breach of the original deal. They've called it provocative. Iran hasn't denied it's doing it. They're not budging on their own terms when it comes to all sanctions must be lifted before they play ball. Uh, the Iranians are also playing hardball. Oh, certainly, without a doubt. But what you have right now is a situation, though, that the Iranians were actually still in the deal. They still are in the deal. Uh, and they stayed in the deal for full three years, waiting for Biden to come in. The expectation was that Biden would come in and would just walk back into the deal and everything would be fine. Instead, Biden chose this extensive negotiation process, and that has created massive bad blood on both sides. And, and on top of that, we now have a different president in Iran that is taking a much, much yes. tougher position. So the opportunities have been lost. But, 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 you know, for how long can we say, well, all of this was Trump's fault? Without a doubt, Trump, you know, shot the first yeah. bullet here and, and walked out of the deal. But if we continue this policy, we're going to be responsible for it.